I am unashamed. What about you? We're back. We're back. We're in the Unashamed podcast. Now, Jace, this is my everywhere I go is the, not necessarily Bucky's, but is the uh, hand sanitizer for every surface touched. You know, it's like. Yeah, I went to buy some. Guess what? Oh yeah, it ain't terrible. I had it. We had a little stockpile. Lisa is a hoarder. She's kind of like mom, and so yeah. she had a bag, a gallon bag with about thirty of these in it. And I was like, man, now there's a case where that came in handy. You know yeah. that you just had some, but that's just kind of the, the strange, way, we're, way strange. we're living in strange days right now. We are. Did you see that well, on the way down here when I was driving? Did you see the woman? Well, she had a cell phone in one hand and a pistol <laughs> on her side. I that's thought. A, What's going on here? <laughs> I mean, she's just going to get her some fresh air. Yeah, well, that's the. That's I saw <laughs> one of our sisters walking up the road here. We don't have but one set of neighbors, but one of the sister, brother, and sisters. Are, are they? I pretty- noticed she was walking along in an exercise mode, and I pulled up there, just kidding around with. Her. I said, "What's in the bag?" She had a bag like like this, carrying like a purse. I said, mm-hmm. "I was thinking." I said. <laughs> I, I said I was going to just kid around with you her. Thought it was going to be a honey bun. No, or I, I I thought it was what she said it was. But I just said, "What's in the bag, our sister?" She said, "I'm packing." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Okay, just checking." Yeah. That's the, I'm packing. <laughs> I've noticed there's been a big run. That explained on, the the the, uh, the purse on my hip. She be just carrying it. Yeah, but yeah. if you notice, there's been a run on toilet paper. We've well documented that. Oh, yeah. Hand, sanitizer, Hand sanitizer. And then guns and ammo. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and there was a pretty good run on that already, but you're right. It picked up. And, of course, you know, the the, the left-wingers, they they took this as their time to shut that down. Out in California, they're like, yeah, non-essential, so they shut down all the gun stores. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, I mean, I, they have the authority to do it, but it just gets you back into that mode again of here we go. I mean, what would it take to shut it down, you know, which is kind of the whole argument, which, which is you need it now more than ever to have protection. I mean, when you're kind of teetering on the bubble here, economic collapse, you got a lot of stuff. I'm, I want to be on Yeah, I mean, some people take it too far, I guess, but. So they do. All right, look, I got a, a good movie since everybody's watching. So yeah, everybody's been TV. asking about stuff. You know, give us ideas to watch. You know, I've been getting a lot of emails about that. Oh, I got a good one. Now, I don't watch much, so. The movie is called, it was released, I think, Friday night. Now, what's happened is you can't go to the movies now. Oh, that's So right. they. How do you watch it? Well, they release movies now, all this live streamers, Amazon Prime, Netflix, and all them. They they you can just watch the movie now. It costs twenty bucks because they're like this is the movie. Well, right. Like if you go to the movie and they're like and there's you can't limit how many people watch it. So you're actually getting a deal. I mean, at first I was like twenty bucks, but then Missy's like, well, if we all went to the movies, it'd be a hundred. And that's not. And we make our popcorn for a dollar. I was going to say the twenty bucks would be a small thing of popcorn and one bottle of water. Oh, there's your twenty bucks right there. Well, don't get me chasing that thing. That is ridiculous. (laughs) It's crazy. It's like they got you over a barrel because I mean you want to eat some popcorn. I have to eat buttered popcorn watching a movie. I just have to do it. I mean, and you've been conditioned to the things popping on the screen. Pop, 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 pop. pop. You're looking at it. You're like, I gotta have it. And then it's like, here's what's weird. Subliminal. It's like small popcorn. You know, five seventy five. You know, medium is like six bucks. Huge. You know, it's like seven bucks. I'm like, well, at this point, once we got over five (laughs) dollars, I'm getting as much, and they know that's what you're gonna do. Well, sure. You know. Yeah. And then it's like free refills. I'm like. If I eat a bucket of popcorn this big and go refill it and eat it. What was the name of the movie that we filmed? We went to Europe. What was the Torchbearer. Torchbearer. That was a good one. The last you movie. You can find that too, by the way, on okay. Amazon Prime. Yeah. Well, well, you yeah you still well let me introduce you. That's the my last movie. movie that they said it's a premiere, so they want to be Is that the last movie you ever saw? That's the last movie I've seen. Oh my goodness, Phil. <laughs> what are you we doing filmed down it four here? years ago? What? Uh, you I can't am, go anywhere. I tell you what I am doing. I I am showing the American public uh, the art and science of doing nothing. 
That's basically <laughs> what I'm well, into that's good. Now. You're in the high-risk age bracket, so I'm not going to argue with that. Hey. All right, the name of the movie is I Still Believe. So do yourself a favor, especially you men out there. Take control of your, your home and say, look, this is especially toward your kids. We got required fun yep. tonight. Make it a family affair. 20 do, bucks, get the whole family in there. You're saving money. Do the popcorn, you know, the waters, whatever, and you get in there and watch it. I, I know the guy the movie's about. I personally know him. I met him. I was speaking somewhere in Florida, I think at his church, and he is obviously the worship leader. He's a contemporary Christian music singer. Jeremy Kemp is his name. How old is Jeremy Kemp? Ah, now you put me on the spot. I'm going to guess at, oh, man, I'm going to say in between 35 and 40. Okay. Maybe. So he's not what young. We, what are we saying? Hey, let, let's test my theory. Uh, so I'm wondering, the reason I ask is because you and I go to a lot of churches and speak, and anytime I go where there's like a real youthful pastor and, and and the worship people that are up front and they're and they're all in their 20s most of them early 30s they all have the same look it's kind of a and it doesn't matter i can go to arkansas i go to florida you go to new york they kind of they cut everything short on the oh, side no. but leave it oh. long up top they got the little i call them elf boots they're little okay they're boots with a pointy shoe on them and now you've hit a nerve with this i i don't know what's going on what it, is that there, there's some it's like churches, a cookie cutter it's like a millennial type feel to right. it that we're all gonna of course your son dresses like i mean reed wears stuff he's like out that. of that stage oh that's good he he, he graduated good but it, you know he went from what 18 to 22 he went through that little stage but now look i took a picture of a guy when i went to that seminar you showed us it's exactly it's like a cookie cutter it's like he was gonna take off <laughs> on, like one of these you know the <laughs> He's With got the, the jet boots pack. and the hair swept back and <laughs> the pants way too tight. Oh, yeah, skinny I'm jeans. Like, skinny jeans are part of it. No. I got, you know, I remember, <laughs> this is this is really funny. I remember one day we were filming Duck Dynasty, and, of course, we all did our own wardrobe, obviously, <laughs> watching the show. But we had a wardrobe person for a little while. At the end, they just said, forget it. What would it matter? You yeah. just the same thing from last week. But we had this, uh, we called her the German. Remember the woman from Germany? Oh, yeah. You, know, she you remember the horses. German dad? Real nice woman. Yeah. And uh, she said, uh, I came in and she said, look, I thought we would change your look a little bit. And so she gave me a shirt. She, she went shopping and bought it. So mm. I was feeling, you know, well, maybe I should try it. Well, she handed me these pants. I didn't look at them. I can't get those things past my ankles. <laughs> and you're pretty skinny. Yeah. I'm like, what 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 are these called? And she said skinny jeans. I said, Oh boy. Let me tell you something. <laughs> if this is a condition for me being on this show, let me just tell whoever is paying you, I'm out. I don't I like to be free roaming. I'm not putting something on that's this uncomfortable. So they, they paid me one visit, the hair and makeup uh, <laughs> faction of the film crew, and some little chick came up, you know, and she said, we're ready for you, Mr. Ralph, the hair and makeup. I'm like, no. <laughs> and I turned and walked away, and that wound that up. <laughs> yeah. I try to keep my, my wordage about how people look at a minimum. Uh, don't <laughs> show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to a man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor, you get over there among yourselves, you become judges with evil thoughts. So there is something to be said about dress Basically, biblically speaking, from what I've been able to see, the overarching uh, uh, thrust is downplay. Dress down. Not well, dress down. What's, what, what's interesting about that? I mean, I'm just saying. I've read the thing from cover to cover. You say, what's you, interesting? You don't want to get too out of about whack. that. About that text is if you were to walk in to this assembly described by James, and they would tell you to go stand over there. Now you weren't. You're not a poor man. 
That is correct. You're actually, by our world of standards, you're that a rich correct. man. But because you look the way you do, they would say, you stand over there. That's correct. And we're well, going to that, that, give this seat to Al, That's why we've you know? had these stories. That's why I got kicked out of the Trump Hotel. I'm like, hey, buddy, I'm supposed to be here. Yeah, right. So if I'm yeah. spiffed up with the, the, the shoes they're wearing, the tight pants, and the flare hair look... <laughs> Uh, if I look like that, hair. I would think it would not be conducive to helping the, the the homeless that we work with all the time. But you know, they really I, do a I'm pretty good saying, job with it. I don't, it's amazing. Here's what I don't like about. I mean, I'm not. I'm going to go with it, you know. But and I'm poking fun because you guys are great. If any I, I of don't you really watch. see, it's what, a cultural thing. I, I don't is. see what the draw. I, to me, if you're all dressing the same way, I mean, we're God reveals himself from the inside out. Uh, so I don't feel like putting that pressure. I'm not sure what that look is. I don't I don't like it. But it is weird. Yeah. That, that is a I weird just thing. poke fun at him when I meet him. You know, it's interesting at our church, <clears throat> so at Row, we are a super blue collarish, you know, lower end socioeconomic church in, in terms of just the people. And that's kind of describes West Monroe. You don't have to have a lot of professional people. You don't see a lot of people wearing suits in our area. And but for a long time at church, when we met uh, at the building, there people still would dress up. But I, I've noticed over the years now there's like yeah. one or two holdouts, you know, oh, but Kirby, some people stopping. believe you have to look your best. That was the mindset. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And even today, there's yeah. churches that they think that somehow or another that you're, you're you're dishonoring God if you're not dressing up. Yeah. Well, look, I, I googled clothing it. and what you uh, wear is not an issue with me. I don't care what you look like. Look, it I me. said Jeremy was 35 to 40. He's 42, and I tried to call him on the way down here because you know I know this guy. We're right. we're friend. We have outside of Jesus. Yeah, we have nothing in common. He's kind of millennial type. You know, but he doesn't wear the. Well, I know I'm shocked. He's closer to us than. But he is. uh, well, he's just a. He's but this movie. He's a talented worship guy. This movie that. characterizes his personality perfectly, but I don't want to tell you too much about the movie because if I think if you don't know the story, then it's going to be that much better for you. My my two daughters, which one by birth, one from Nicaragua, they watched this. They had no idea. I mean, we, I said, here's the way I put it. I was like. These people are friends of mine. They made a movie about them. I want to watch the movie. And so, they were, of course, they were kind of griping at first. And let me tell you, they loved, in all caps, loved that movie. So, it, so yeah, my and my uh, 14-year-old granddaughter saw it and loved it. So, I mean, it appeals to a wide range. Well, of, a lot of Christian movies in the past were kind of cheesy, let's be honest. And uh, they just weren't well done. But here, here recently, I mean, they figured out they, this was done by the Irwin brothers, and it's very well done. You can go to uh, what is that site where you go check the movies out? That I, I think it's called IMDb. Which, by the way, you know, I I had recommended when I recommended the Messiah, we got a few emails saying, I mean, Jace is four rated R movies. You wouldn't think I'd have to clarify this. I mean, ninety five percent of rated R movies, I'm never going to watch. But you can go to sites like that, and they'll tell you why it's rated R. So I read it. But things that are true stories or things that are not that bad, which my point was I made on the podcast, is that if you made a movie about the Old Testament, oh, it would be rated R. Well, But, but some legalists would say, well, I can't go watch that because it has an R. Well, it's just like when anything we talk, else. In I life. recommend highly an R-rated movie that everybody should watch this week, as soon as you see this podcast, and it's called The Passion of the Christ. We're right in the we're right in the exactly. Easter season. I mean, <laughs> what better thing to watch than I had? Now, look, is did did Gibson portray it brutally? Yes, and you know what? So did the New Testament writers. I it mean, was I'm, brutal. It was I'm probably all, worse than what he's. Oh, it probably was. He could only do so much. Either. Well, I'm not easily offended, but I'm like. To take that comment and then to make a jump about, oh, it's rated R, therefore I can never watch a rated R movie, is coming from a person who's rule oriented. You know? No, you use, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to watch filth. I won't watch filth. I, you know, I've gone to the movies before and left after 90 seconds. Yeah, because I mean, you're like, back well, all here. You know, I, but now you can look <laughs> them all up. So now you know what you're getting into. Right. I do not watch a movie until I look at the parental mm-hmm. guidance. You know, if it's like 
It'll say basically somebody, and that's from viewers. It'll say, well, ninety. I would say over ninety percent of the movies that I look at that I don't watch. And like you said, we're we're a big, you know, <clears throat> unashamed thank you because I know there's a lot of people that watch our podcast that are in the business that are producing good faith films now. Yeah. Thank you for doing it and getting it on a high level of acting and high quality and getting some so money. So what into y'all it. are trying to say is a man of my particular persuasion. Uh, <clears throat> I don't go watch movies. I don't have a cell phone to watch whatever's on that. And I don't well, turn a click on to the internet. So I'm missing movies, internet, and mm-hmm. cell phones. Yeah, you're missing so a lot of stuff. A, it's a, just, a, just a block. Just a, I don't think you have the capability so, so, to watch the movie I recommended. I don't think y'all have like Amazon Prime. Have you ever heard of that? No. Okay, forget I brought that up. But for everybody else, they know. I'm thinking, you know, down in Brazil on the Amazon no, he basin. Can, no, there's a he company can, he called. Can, he can watch Amazon. it because Dan, they watch dad stuff sometimes on, on TV. I think it's a smart Well, you get TV. Dan. Look, y'all can have When Dan. you watch your show, you're watching something on the internet. If you yeah, ever watch. That's why Dan says somebody got stirred up about something, you know. And until you watch He'll it. walk over. <clears throat> he'll have look like a little pad yep. of a thing. And, you know, but it's always, wait just a minute, I can't get the, you know, <laughs> burp, 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 burp. and well, it's, it's punching buttons. And, well, do me a It's favor. always a 1960s say, this robot is what, sound. This is what riles a certain group of people up. <laughs> beep, boop, beep, I think beep, boop, I beep, always beep, tell beep. them, I said, if I, you know, stick my foot in my mouth too much, I mean, I'd like to know that so I won't repeat that. So, well, do I, me a favor you tonight. You say enough. Some things you say, so I should have. Hang on, we're late. we're late for a break. I want to I wanna hear your response to that. Let's take a quick break. So our uh, our friends at Black Rifle, which we drink here on the Unashamed Podcast, and it just gets better every time. I just drank a cup. I, you know, I think once you get used to it, it's it's just oh boy. yeah, you got the have gift it. that keeps on giving. I switched over to there. now that that Black Rifle. That's all. The Mar- yeah, we got we got that. We're pro own. military. We're pro strong coffee. They <laughs> assess those two situations. So tell everybody how they. Can yeah. Get so them. you know, their their founder is an Army Ranger. Uh, great guys, and and even now they're really they've got a great uh, promo they're doing right now. So if you order a, a bag of Black Rifle coffee. They're going to donate a pound of that same coffee for everyone, people call in and buy, to medical personnel, people that are really awesome. on the front. Because, look, coffee is what's going to keep it going because people are working long I hours. like it because they're veterans because these guys would, would know what a good cup of coffee, how yeah. good that would be with the, with the job they do. Exactly. So we want to be a part of this buy a bag, give a bag initiative. So you want to move on this. we got 10 days to make that happen, especially when it's needed. Of course, they got a great club subscription, which is what we do. We we just get the coffee shows up at our door, which is awesome. So you purchase at blackriflecoffee.com slash fill. Blackriflecoffee.com slash fill. Use the promo code fill. You get 20% off your first order. So you're going to get save some money, get some great coffee, help out some great vets who have started a wonderful business. And for the next 10 days, you're going to help people on the front line of this uh coronavirus epidemic so it's a great time to do it check it out blackriflecoffee.com slash field do it today get down to come down put that movie i still believe in you and miss k can have date night tonight and make you some pop mom would love it you she'll know, love it but look get her some the clean. last time i saw this quarantine living the way it looked in the living room i looked up at the clock and it said four o'clock in the evening <laughs> And I looked to my left, and there's my woman of 55, 60 years. She's sprawled back in a chair. She's not moving. She's asleep. The dogs, they're all sitting there, feet stuck up in the air. I mean, everybody was just were just, just on the couches, on the chairs. Just I said, I know what's wrong with this whole bunch. Even the dogs are bored. <laughs> You could, you're like you were like you had a you when had your a, dogs get bored. That's uh, that's what happens when you're under a lockdown for about. So you were like lone waddy. Now you're like yeah. a man can get used to this quarantine. Oh, living. I'm telling you, man. Oh, I, look, I caused the biggest ruckus at our house yesterday because you know my dog Biggin. He when I let him out of the pen, this thing is he's just bulldozing anything in his path. Just yeah. all the neighbors have come to me at some. 
time or another about something he's done. Shut him down. Shut him down, you know. So now I've been trying to keep up with him because I don't want him to run out of my sight, you know, because he's, he's fired up. Well, my other little bitty dog, got a little lap dog called Hazel. I'm not sure what that little thing is. She hears all the ruckus because I'm running through the yard with my dog. Well, I didn't realize because I didn't really think anybody was noticing this. But what Missy told me yesterday is now since they're bored and have nothing to do, every time I let my dog out, they gather out at the window to watch me and the dog run around through the yard. Well, yesterday of all times. That's when you've gotten down to boredom at its worst. I mean, what are we doing here? We're so, watching so you look, and the dog. I lined him up on the street because he'd come up there and he was ticking me off about something, so I made him sit down, and he was just trying to go. I was like, well, my other little dog came, and she's plopped down. And so then it felt like we were in a race, like at the starting line. So I was like, okay, I got up there. I was like, on your mark. And the neighborhood I, is studying the situation. They're, they're watching this. What you going to do next? <laughs> so look, I'm like, on your mark, get set, go. And I took off, of course, Megan, he was to the finish line in 2.5 seconds. I take off, and I'm like, I, if I just beat Hazel, that'll be something. So look, What's the old she, rock and rollers? There's something happening here. What it is ain't as clear. <laughs> no, so I don't know you're sitting in. I don't know what it is. So let me tell you the end of the story. So I go to the mailbox. Uh, you know, I finish second. Well, Hazel, she's running so fast. And she's a little overweight, little. She only weighs like seven pounds, but five of it is in the midsection. Look, <laughs> she's like she, a pot belly pig. She's just dragging yeah, in the middle. She had a weight shift, and she starts. She's running so fast that that she starts losing her direction. And look, she just runs off the road and falls <laughs> over. I thought she had died. <laughs> it was the funniest thing ever. So when I walk in, look, my whole family, they're in tears. And I'm like, what What happened? They said, oh, we've been watching you race the dogs. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is when uh, you can say, you know, something's happening. What it is ain't exactly clear. <laughs> So I thought I'd let you in on that. Uh, we, so, we call that entertainment. Get on something a little more meaty than the <laughs> redneck stories. <laughs> One thing we can be for sure, Dad, Jason ain't going to run out of stories. Have you no. noticed that? <laughs> Just All a right, day, so, of, day of my life of quarantine living. Since we're, <clears throat> since we're going to get serious, uh, let's do it in John 3. So we, we set up last time, or I think we set up last time. Wow, that was a 45-minute argument to nowhere. <laughs> I know. So I'm going to I'm gonna be a little more contained today to keep us on track. Well, I wrote down a bunch of notes because I wanted to try it again. Because what I thought Phil and I, because we're getting to, we're, we're in John 3, and just to, I'll set it up. I mean, here comes a religious leader, Pharisaical, Nicodemus, at night. Which, which some people don't think is a big deal. I kind of do. That was a huge deal. Yeah. Because he's doing it on the QT. He doesn't want his fellow Pharisees to know this was a clandestine. But what was interesting about Nicodemus is, and we know this from later. By the way, he pops up again in John 7 and John 19. Well, tell what where he pops up because so, so, I'll save my argument till the last. All one. right. So, so we see about him. So we, we have what we'll be talking about in the next couple of podcasts. But then in John 7, he pops up again. Uh, because I don't remember the John seven reference. Well, here's what here's what was going on there. So in John seven, the the Jewish leadership decides they've had it with Jesus, so they sent their temple guards to get him. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like, just go arrest him and bring him back. They're ready to do something about this now. Of course, we're way early. Jesus isn't ready for that yet. So the guards go and watch him and listen to him, and then they think, well, you can't arrest him. And I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but it went, so when they show back up in verse 47, uh, the, the the they start chewing him out, and they said, "You mean he's deceived you also?" Yeah. yeah. So Nicodemus took up for him. Nicodemus, I'm it now. yeah, in verse fifty, yeah. who had gone to Jesus earlier, and what is their own number says, "Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him out to see what he's been doing?" So he's a voice of rational thought because he realizes how stupid this is they were like he you know he he gets it now he, he's got something in him and then of course we know he basically becomes part of the believers because when you get to john 19 the guy joseph of arimathea whenever they're preparing jesus's body well guess who's right there with him nicodemus because yep. you had to have some official to do that because everyone needs to remember this before jace goes into his john 3 text 
When Jesus was talking about John the Baptist, he said, there's no one greater than John, yet the one who's least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, what a great man John the Baptist was. This guy is famous for baptizing people. They acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. Now listen to this. But this is the overarching text that everybody needs to remember when they're looking at John 3. But the Pharisees and experts in the law, and Nicodemus was of that group who had Truth. said, no, wait a minute, the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. They wouldn't let him baptize them. Right. So just remember that in the context yeah. of John 3 or any other text about somebody being baptized in water. There was a group well, yeah, of Pharisees it, and teachers of the law that true. said, no, sir, nope. And there's no doubt that was the context of this discussion. Let's take, well, I think let, the let's context. Take a quick, let's take a quick break, Jason, and we'll come back. But I think the context of John 3 is, you know, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. That's, that, you know, the most famous verse ever. And he's introducing this idea of starting again, which he put being born again. And then he then goes into a description what it means to have the Holy Spirit right. be, being led by the Holy Spirit. I mean, to me, now if you want to make the connection of the Holy Spirit being given to us as individuals when you're baptized, I got plenty of verses about that. Even Jesus himself, sure, when he was baptized. And remember, that's how it, John the Baptist distinguished the difference between his baptism and Jesus' baptism. He said that. He said, this, this is one who will baptize with the Spirit, yep. meaning that his was not. So let me, let me just, having said that, let me make my point, because I feel like last time, Phil and I agree with kind of the end result, sure. but how we get there, we, we didn't necessarily agree. And I think my point was there's so much confusion about baptism because it's a tough subject when you read Ephesians 2, 6, and 7, and you read like you brought up Acts 2, where he, you Ephesians know, 4, where he said, right. you know, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So when I gave the illustration about the battlefield, because I read an email about this from somebody listening to the podcast, and so I just assumed people knew what I was saying, but when I look back on it, I didn't I didn't really say. So I want to say it now. I said, when you're on a battlefield and you're in a war, which that contrasts to life already. I mean, even Ephesians says that. You know, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but the spiritual forces of evil. But if you're trying to gain victory, the last thing you would do is surrender. And so I, I made baptism – symbolic of of a surrender and here's why i did that because you said well what if i surrender what would happen well if they shot me you know we always just think immediately they'd like take you into custody but in my analogy i meant well if you just give up and you're shot and you die that would be the last thing you would think would be for victory but i did i left that part out if you get shot once you surrender and die the point is that is the path to victory and I link that to baptism, and here's why. And y'all can jump in as I go along with this, but if we read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that we've read many times, that the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. He, he remind, The Corinthians have forgot that. How embarrassing. Well, then we'll read a text like Romans 6, 1 through 4, or even 1 through 6 that says in the argument about should I sin so that grace may increase, he says, no, we died. So which gets to my illust illustration. We were therefore buried just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. We too may live a new life. Well, then it says, for we know that our old self was crucified, died, surrendered. Well, if you look at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, because I did in preparation for this, what did he do on the cross? 
he basically surrendered. In, in fact, I read all four gospel accounts. He says, Father, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. And, and they all use the same type of ter- ter- terminology. And with this, he gave up his life. He, you know, because I looked at the words, they all use that same type of phraseology in all the gospels. So you see where I'm going with this. When you tie in the verses like in John 12 where Jesus said, uh, unless a seed dies, it cannot produce fruit. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yep. Uh, all the verses where he says anyone who comes to me you know, must bring his own cross, he keeps using this, this death, and we focus on death and resurrection. What we don't focus on, which I'm going back to 1 Corinthians 15, is the burial. I mean, just think about when's the last time you heard a verse or a sermon about the burial of Jesus? Mm -hmm. We don't stress that. But I think that's why people don't understand baptism, because I think it is a burial. You're on the battlefield. You die. We're buried. What does burial have to do with anything? Well, watch what I did. This is for illustrative purposes. And then I want to get y'all's comment. I Googled the purpose of a funeral. Because I'm, I'm linking baptism as a surrender, which is not of yourself. It's the exact opposite. You're, you've heard what Jesus did for you. You've been introduced to Jesus. That's what saves you, period, exclamation point. You take that out, there would be no reason to be baptized. So is that more important? Yes. Even, uh, what is that, Mark says that, whoever believes in his baptized will be saved. You know, go preach good news right. to all creation. Whoever believes in his baptized will be saved. But then it said, whoever does not believe will be condemned. Well, if you don't have the knowledge or the belief and trust in Jesus, you can forget baptism. So I think that's a good way to illustrate the importance of this. Sure. And if you force me to make a decision, I'm going to go to the point in time you heard about Jesus rather than I am about being baptized. Because without Jesus, you don't know why you would be baptized. That it's irrelevant. The gospel has to right. be on the front end, is what you're saying. There's no doubt. I think it. And you can't chop it. You can't chop it in two. If you right. if you don't go through the burial <clears throat> after the death, and if you don't include the resurrection, you you're never going to understand baptism ever. Well, listen to this. Listen to this. now. This is an illustration, but to get my point, I think you'll be fascinated. The definition of the purpose of a funeral. Look, this is not a Christian site here. I just went with the first one. These this has nothing to do with about Jesus, but just I think you'll be fascinated what they came up with. The purpose of the funeral is to help us acknowledge that someone we love or dislike has died. Well, think just take take that to baptism. You know, our problems, our old self, going back to Romans 6. Now, some of us develop a dislike for our old self, but a lot of the reasons we got into trouble and did so many sins is because we love our old self, you know? And so there has to be an acknowledgement, this was God's idea, not mine, that that person has died, and we're going to bury him. Yep. All right, well, look, at number two, they says, to offer continuity and hope for the living. Well, same thing happens because you once you come up, you it it brings you hope that you know what, just like he told Nicodemus, you can be born again. Number three, provide a support system for us. Well, I don't know of anything on the earth that doesn't offer a bigger support system than when a person's baptized. Even it gives you a place to give you a reference about, and I've said this many times, I know you have. But when people bring up our past, I've said before, oh, yeah, that was pre-Jesus. We buried that guy. He's dead. <clears throat> He's got, they're like, do what? what it, they, do, they go Nicodemus then. Like, what, what do you mean? When my old buddies tracked me down after a year after I had repented and I had my faith in Jesus and I was baptized, they finally found out what happened to me. I disappeared. Mm-hmm. Unlisted phone number down here in these woods. Mm-hmm. Well, when they pulled up in my yard and they said, "Come on and go with us. Let's go up the road and have a beer, Robson." I said, "No." And what I told them is that 
the one you're looking for. He died, you know. And they said, what? I said, the Phil Robertson you're looking for has died. He doesn't live anymore. They looked at each other and said, that sounds like some kind of religious kick you're on. I said, I think it's more a little more than a click than a kick. So yeah. I said, this is the new one. I'm not going to run with y'all anymore, <laughs> ever. I said, so you might as well go up the road. I said, What's I'm, ironic is you use the I've same. I've given my life to Jesus, you and the, the one you're looking for is not here you anymore. You use the same phrase the angels told the disciples when they come running up there. They said, the one you're looking for is not here anymore. I didn't yeah. explain <laughs> baptism to them. I just said, this is a new person here, and the one you're looking for does not exist. All right. And they looked at each other like he's gone nuts. Well, I was hang, speaking about my new birth. Hang on. We're late for a break, and then uh, go, Joe. And so the last thing that it said about the purpose of the funeral was to allow us to reflect on the meaning of life and death. I mean, they took four principles about what happens at a funeral. And when you apply them to being buried in Jesus, it's amazing how that's exactly what it is. Hmm. And my point is, if I go back and read Romans 6, because you think about just think about this from why Jesus was buried, because Jesus is what saves you. That's what you're reenacting. It is not of yourselves because you're surrendering. You're doing the opposite of of doing anything to earn your salvation. You're dying. It's basically an act of faith is what you're saying. Right. But think about why was Jesus buried? I mean, have you ever thought about it? What was the purpose of that? To prove he was dead. There you go. Just that word prove, to prove, to remove doubt. Because well, you have a theory going around, even to this day, they call it the swoon theory. Oh yeah, that he didn't really die. He just passed he out. He just for passed a out, and they put, and then he, you know, nobody knew where he was. So let me just stop you. We we didn't go over this, but I love your your initial response is exactly my point. Because faith is being sure of what we hope for, which is what you just said, of being sure sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. Hebrews 11. The reason Jesus was buried, because that removed doubt. This was, you know, a lot of people have come up with these things. You know, I've met people, and they say, you know, I died three times. And I'm like, no. (laughs) Now, (laughs) your heart might have stopped beating, and you're calling that death. But if you're going to link that to what happened with Jesus, I want you in the ground three days. And then... You come you, back you then, you we come got back a story. From that, I'm going to listen to whatever you got to say. Because <laughs> that, remo- and people are like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, I get, I'm not taking away from your heart stopping and you coming back. Right. Awesome. You got another chance. But quit going around telling everybody you died. Because that, that was the it wrong. It is appointed for man yeah. to die once. And, that's right. And you might have died, but we didn't bury you, which is why Jesus was buried. But I, I want to just try to, and, and I'm going to take advantage of this text just to, just a little bit to prove my point, because if you go back to Romans 6, because that's what we're talking about, we're talking about why baptism is so confusing to explain. And we're in John 3, and it is confusing. There's no doubt about yeah. that. Well, Romans 6, which is reenacting what saves you, the death, burial, and resurrection, and in the context of him saying, well, don't go out there and live a life of sin so that God's grace is just going to keep that's the wrong attitude, and he uses baptism because he's like, that person died. The proof you died is the But burial. now if you tie it in with the reason Jesus was buried so that you would remove doubt, I want you to center in on one word as I read this, K-N-O-W, no. You say, what's that got to do anything? Because you're going to be sure through that funeral that you participated in at baptism It's going to make you sure that that person is gone. Watch. He says in verse 2, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now look at verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in order that just as Christ from the as just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will, look, here's a certainly, mm-hmm. faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain. We will, we will certainly 
be united with him in his resurrection. Now, I, I, we did all that to get to this third word here in verse 6 again. For we know that our old self was crucified. We, we know this. So that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And look, he even says it again in verse 9. Now, in verse 8, it says, If we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer is his mastery over him. So that's what I my whole point is. It's not you doing something. It, you're doing the opposite, just like Jesus did. You're, you know, I know it's faith and action, but it's actually from God's idea done in a way of surrender, which takes you out of the process. You're, you're actually dying because Jesus died mm-hmm. to your old self. I was just saying, I think if you look at it that way, you'll, you won't become legalistic and start trying to baptize people without Jesus which a lot of people have done. They just read the verses and say, well, you need to be baptized, and if you don't do it, I mean, here's the verses. Mm-hmm. Well, where's Jesus at? <clears throat> you see that a lot with young people. Yeah. It's, it's like, well, it's about time you get baptized. And yeah. they're like, well, I don't even, okay, if if you say so. You know, you see little kids and stuff. They well, don't think know. about it. how many people have you baptized that you that um, were baptized before when they were a little kid and had no idea what they were doing. So then they got out there and saw it and thought, "Oh no!" You know, some of these places they'll go in like to a camp or something. And they'll watch a real scary apocalyptic mm-hmm. movie. I, I've seen them. Oh yeah. Well, you know, you got a bunch of ten and eleven year olds and they're watching, you know, dragons and wars, and they're like, "Let me tell you Monsters. something. If you don't get baptized, you're." out this Look, is what well guess what they all run to the water <laughs> i turned 12 years old and my buddy who was about 12 came up to me one day and said let's go get baptized i said let's go for it <clears throat> i go in there he does too we're baptized at 12 and when people ask me about that later they said what what went on there i said nothing i said because i cert- i'm 12 i said I didn't know what dying to sin. I never even heard the gospel. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know anything <clears throat> of what you just read about Jesus dying, being buried, and raised. I never heard it. So I was being baptized, like you say, without Jesus. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know who he so, was. Uh, well, let's take one last, uh, one last break, and then we'll talk about that. So the thing is, and I've had people ask me before, we had some questions from the podcast listeners. Well, yeah, but you said Ephesians four one baptism, and and yet you got baptized twice. Some people more than twice. So they're like, that's confusing to them again. Again, it's confusing. But remember, from God's perspective, there's only one time where you did it for the right reason. Millions you know, so will say there is only one. Just say, <clears throat> accept Jesus in your heart. He died for you, but they won't mention, like Jay said, his burial and his resurrection. Right. Unless there is a sequence of events from God in flesh, you will never understand baptism. You will never understand it. No, it's just somebody getting dunked underwater. It seems silly. But here's what you got to remember. The the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when you read what happened in Acts 2, which is what Jesus referred to here in John 3, you know, he said you got to be born again, which here's a religious leader. That'd be like a famous pastor coming up, and he's like, Hey, I can tell you're walking with the Lord. And he says, well, let me tell you. Yep, you're right, and you need to be born again. Well, you just wouldn't tell a preacher for years or a religious leader that you need to start completely over. <laughs> Whatever you, cause Which is what he heard. That's what he heard. And he's yeah. like, well, oh, well, how am I going to crawl up in the womb there? I've only been born. Uh, I've already been born. Because he was looking at it from an argumentative standpoint, like, oh, Great idea. Let me get back in my mother's womb. But then Jesus introduces, for the first time yeah. in that guy's world, the Holy Spirit, being born of the Spirit, having the Holy Spirit, being like the wind. You see its results, Why are you there? but you don't Why know where are there? it comes from. If you look carefully after John wrote the beginning of John in chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, words with God. He was God. All He made everything. 
and here he comes to earth. He came to that which was, was his own, but his own did not receive him, the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Nope. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name. Watch this. He gave the right to become children of God. Now, watch this. Children born not of natural descent, not you coming out of your mother's womb, Correct. nor of human decision, you coming out of your, let's have some kids, or a husband's will. It's not a physical birth, but born of God. Right. That right there prepares you Phil, for what he said in John 3. In John's context, you got to remember he had, he had just written two chapters before in John 1, Yep, 12, talking about Jesus, who he is. He also said, yet to all who received him, which is why we said is more important than what happens after. Have to know who he is That's and what right. he's done. He gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent. That's what he was trying to explain to Nicodemus. That's correct. But nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So that's what he was trying to introduce, and that's why there's so many arguments about that, because how many times have you heard arguments where people, they'll bring up the thief on the cross. They're like, well, he wasn't baptized. But Jesus was introducing a new concept. Correct. The Holy Spirit of God, God himself, is going to be poured out, and you can get it. Well, you say, well, when did that happen? Well, when you read Acts 2, it's pretty obvious when it happened. Mm -hmm. He was introducing it here. And even an obscure— we, Well, you knew it hadn't happened in John 14 through 16 because he was explaining it to the disciples. It was coming. The Up to that point. Spirit, well, let me read you— The Spirit had not been given because Well, let me Jesus. read you that well, verse. Wrap, wrap there's a, up, there's an up, interesting man. verse that says in verse uh, 38 of John 7, which is where we were with Nicodemus— Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him, which he was what he was trying to tell Nicodemus. You say, well, what is that? Verse 39, by this he meant the spirit whom those who, who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So was the thief on the cross saved? Of course, because sure. God knows the heart along with every other person in the Old Testament. But here, once the Spirit was revealed, God gave you a way, an opportunity to be buried right. with Him and, and receive God's deposit. Spirit. So next time, we'll go there, because really, once you understand the Spirit of God more clearly, it makes a lot more sense what we're talking about here and the distinction between the two. So we'll do that next time on Unashamed. So we're so glad you guys were with us today. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube or Facebook. And be sure and rate us on iTunes so that other people can know about the podcast.